Quantum Faith, Annette Caps. A spirit created matter. The world, according to physics. <laughs> Good day, all. Mm -mm -mm. I keep hearing this phrase. Your words affect the matter of your life. Your words affect the matter of your life. So we've been looking from this little book of Annette Capps, Quantum Faith. Quantum Faith, combining quantum physics and faith. The material world the study of the material world and the realities of the supernatural world. Just going back, I want to read a little bit. I may read quite a bit today, as a matter of fact. Father, I thank you today for your word. Oh, Father. I just keep hearing you say in my heart and mind over and over, your body is made of clouds of atoms and your words affect the matter of your life. Your words affect the matter of your life. And so, Father, I thank you today that you help me to stay the course, to communicate clearly, and Father, I pray the Ephesians prayer for those that hear this message, the eyes of their understanding to be enlightened, O oh, Father, to these exciting realities that you are revealing in our times. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just reading from Annette's book for just a little bit here to get our foundation laid. She says, I began studying quantum physics because I was curious. I became enthralled when I realized the similarities to how faith works and what Jesus taught his disciples about the principles of mountain moving faith and the spoken word. Mark eleven twenty three, Jesus said, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. <laughs> Looking at it from a surface level, it would seem a ridiculous statement that Jesus made. How is it possible that spoken words would send a mountain into the sea? For the past 27 years, it has required faith on my part to believe that words are that powerful. Recent study, however, in the area of quantum physics has convinced me that Jesus, what Jesus spoke is absolute scientific fact. Hmm. So it's just not a spiritual thing taken by faith that words are powerful. It's been scientifically proven now through the study of quantum physics. The study of our the minute things of which our body is made that they can see now with microscopes and things. Last week, 
we spent time talking about, again, a spirit that you can't see created all of the matter that we do see. All the things you can look outdoors right now and see with your eyes or looking at your body or your house or where the place where you're working or wherever it may be. So we talked about the chocolate cake last week. The chocolate cake you ate yesterday was made from things which do not appear. You go, what? Huh. The recipe probably called for water. Before, hydrogen and oxygen were combined into water, you couldn't see them. You couldn't see the hydrogen and the oxygen. Yet the substance for water was there. You just couldn't see it. They go through a process of combining these two uh, elements that we can't see that are there. And as they do that, then it turns into water. Going on now. So we talked about that last week. That we have things around us. We don't see the air around us, yet we breathe it. It keeps us alive. We can't see it. Going on now. Scientists have performed experiments with atoms in their subatomic particles, such as electrons. If you paid attention in school, you saw the diagram of an atom with an electron orbiting it, like the Earth orbits the sun. So you see the little nucleus of the atom in the middle, and the little dots represent the protons that are circling the atom. All atoms are made of a nucleus and electrons. I'm going to move my phone there and see if the connection stays a little better. Hey, this is what I wanted to get to today. Then. The interesting thing, however, is that scientists have discovered just in these last years, that the electron that is shown orbiting the nucleus is not always there in the little particle form. It exists in a wave or cloud state until someone looks at it. It exists in a wave or cloud state until someone looks at it. I could read you the physics experiments that they've done, and they have discovered that atoms are just a cloud. But the minute they looked at it through a microscope, or the scientists looked at it through a microscope, the particle formed, the little dot that you normally see. The question is, how does it know someone's looking at it? Ooh, 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 ooh. Things are getting spooky now. <laughs> How does it know someone's looking at it? So you know what that tells me? That tells me that your body's atoms know when you're talking to them, when you're interacting with them. It's been scientifically proven that the atoms of which our bodies are made interact with human beings. I had a scripture I'm going to share with you later. Psalm 115, 16. It says, The heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Hmm. You know, we think God is in control of everything that goes on down here. But that verse says, He has limited his sovereign control to heaven. And he has given the dominion over the earth to the children of men. And that ties right in with Genesis when he said, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. So, interesting thoughts. Hmm? So that could be why Adams, God created Adams to react to human beings. But we don't even know they're there. They're in existence. 
but they're in the unseen realm, just like the hydrogen and the oxygen from which the water was made that made the cake. And we're not conscious right now. You can't necessarily tell me that you're conscious of the air around you. Well, that's like the atoms in your body. You're not conscious that your body is made of atoms. That it's like your body, a silly way to put it, it's like it's one big cloud. And it has taken the shape of words that have been spoken over it. Just a thought, a thought I'm thinking about. Oh, my, my body's just one big cloud. It's going to be what, it's going to take the shape of whatever I say to it. I go, oh Lord, that's pretty far out right there. But who knows? Who knows? And God's wisdom is so far beyond ours. He wants to reveal it to us, though. And if he wants to tell me that my body's just nothing but a big cloud, and it's going to be what it, it's going to be, what my words, what my words say, and how I interact with it. Oh dear, well, going on. <clears throat> the interesting thing, let me read it to you again. The interesting thing that scientists have discovered is that the electron is sh that is shown orbiting the nucleus is not always there in particle form. It exists in a wave state, like a cloud, everywhere at once until someone looks at it. That little teeny weeny thing that I can't even see knows if I look at it. You know, here a couple weeks ago I did a study or did a little teaching on quantum entanglement. Oh my, yes, the, your very look causes the atoms of your body to take pay attention. Mm -mm -mm. When the scientist observes it, it suddenly appears as a dot or a particle, so it changes from a cloud to a particle. What we all want to know is, how does it know someone's looking at it? Hmm. So when you look at your body, it's looking back. When you talk to your body, it's going to become what you say to it. How does it know someone's looking at it? It obviously is responding to the observer's interaction with it. One of the difficulties in quantum physics is that the particles, listen to this now, behave differently for each person. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like to me, God has given us an individuality and a dominion over the atoms and the matter of our life, and they're going to respond to it, each one of you, how you relate to them. They respond to each individual observer. This is science. This is scientifically proven now. Does it behave according to what the scientist believes? Oh, dear me. Just take the word scientist out and put I in there. How does it know I'm looking at it? Is it going to respond according to what I'm saying, what I'm thinking, what I'm believing? In any event, we can definitely conclude that Jesus was right when he taught that all matter responds to faith and words. He was revealing a scientific principle that was not going to yet be understood or known until hundreds of years in the future. Even Einstein, he didn't understand these things. This is all the has opened up as technology has developed for them to be able to study things at the micro, the little teeny tiny level. Back with um, Newton and those different men, Kepler and those way, they used telescopes and they looked out into the night sky. So they looked at the big things. Well, now they got microscopes that look way down into the little teeny tiny things, into the micro things. And they're understanding how how the world and the matter of it is actually constructed and functions and works. So that's all basically that Annette is telling us is that it's all lining up with scripture and the things that have been revealed in scripture years ago. 
Jesus taught that all matter responds to faith and words, the substance from which our world is made is influenced and manifested by words. See, again, a spirit created matter. And how did God do it? In the beginning, God, the spirit, said. We've been talking about how God made you a speaking spirit. A wild thought came to me just a little while ago. You, the speaking spirit, affect the atoms of your life, the clouds of atoms of your life, and they'll become what you say to them. Go on. Oh, Lord. That's a heavy revy right there. Yes, we're a speaking spirit, just like God. But we don't draw that out to think that our words affect the matter of our life, just like God created matter and affected matter with words. <laughs> Jesus taught that all matter responds to faith and words. It's talking about li you living and operating on a whole different realm than what we've been used to in the five senses all the time. The substance from which our world is made is influenced and manifested by our words. The things that you desire are made up of atoms. The things that you desire are made up of atoms. They know what you believe. They hear what you say and behave accordingly. They know your atoms. Atoms know what you believe. They hear what you say and they behave accordingly. I was just thinking right there about a baby in the womb. The baby's body that's being created in the womb is made of atoms. That physical body that's forming in there is made of atoms, just like your body is. So we speak words over that body while it's still in the womb. We call it normal. We call it whole. We call it healed. We call that child wise. We call that child productive in life, blessed. We speak over that person, the person and the body before it even enters the world. Let it take shape with your words. Shape it with your words. Then I want to go over to page 13 right here. <clears throat> All things matter are made of atoms, including your children, your car, your computer, and your house. None of these, quote, things is solid, including your kitchen table, even if it's made of oak. This is a hard thing for us to grasp. I mean, just the eraser on this pencil right here is made of millions of atoms. They It looks solid because there's so many of them. But if you got this underneath and you went down and you looked at that eraser, clear down with an electron microscope or more where you got right down, you could actually see the atoms of which this eraser is made. You'd see that it's all air. <clears throat> Your kitchen table, everything is all air. But there's just thousands of atoms together, and that's what makes it look solid. You may not be able to see the space between the atoms in your table. But if you could see that small, you'd also see that they're moving. That's right. <laughs> your kitchen table is vibrating. Everything has a frequency of vibration. You vibrate, your car vibrates, and even the mountain behind the trees out in your yard are vibrating. <laughs> oh, yes, dear. What do we say to that? I'm just dropping some things in you today, putting some, dropping some things in your lap. Going over now to page 23. Some of you may have this little book. You can follow along with me. In quantum mechanics or quantum physics, the observation of something changes it. You can never really be sure if it existed before you even looked. Because you looked, you actually interfered with whatever was before you looked. <laughs> if this sounds confusing, it really isn't. It just means that we affect everything around us just by how we see it or what we believe. Whew. The heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth is he given to the children of men. Jesus said to the centurion in Matthew chapter 8, as you have believed, so will be it done unto you. It's a good thing he believed his servant was healed. Our perceptions return to us exactly what we perceive. How you interact with this quantum field of possibilities. Oh, my, 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 my. See, what, what I'm really calling you to do is start interacting with this quantum field of possibilities. 
the atoms are there for healing in your body, for your finances, for, for a blessed life. They're all there. They're waiting for you. They exist in a cloud form, and they're waiting for you to observe them and talk to them. Oh, brother, you're way out now. I know. <laughs> but faith is the substance of things over. We want to know why does faith work? Why does confession work? Why do I have to speak words? What am I? Am I more than a body? You mean I'm a spirit too? What, a, what in the world is that? I am a spirit? Well, how, what does that mean? How does that function? Well, well, how does that relate in my everyday life? Well, we're kind of talking about it here. Quantum physics is revealing how spiritual realities interact with everyday life. I want to show you now a cloud. To show you I'm not fibbing to you today, and, and Annette wasn't either. So hang on. I'm going to turn my thing around here. Okay. Get my little tablet over here now. This right here is what she's talking about, what they've discovered. See, all this right around here, these are the, you don't see the little dots of the proteins. That's the nucleus of the atoms. This is the atoms your body's made up of. Everything around you is made up in the natural of these little atoms. And the little protons that you normally saw as little dots, well, that's what they knew then. But now with the powerful microscopes and things they have, they've discovered that this is a cloud. It is, it says here, it is an electron cloud. Represents the area around an atom's nucleus where electrons are most likely to be found. It is a sphere that surrounds the microscopic nucleus. So that's one picture of it. Which part of an atom is most like a cloud? the protons and the neutrons. Why are electrons modeled as a cloud? What is the quantum cloud model of an atom? What is another name for the cloud model of an atom? What would an atom actually look like? So see all the, it's quite a topic, the cloud. A proton, what did it say up here? An electron cloud waiting to be shaped. Hallelujah. Here's some images. I wanted to show you some other images of them too. This is this is just you. You're you're just all, you know, here's this is the one over here we were looking at. Here's another one up here. They're describing, oh, there's many, many pictures of the different ones. Another one. All their ways. Look at this right here. That is another one. Atomic theory. Clouds. All kinds of, there's another one and another one. So, the fact that there is an electron cloud of what your atom is made and those little electrons and protons are just waiting for you to interact with them. <laughs> Thank you, Father. My body's just a great big cloud, and it's going to be what I say to it to be. It's going to be what I call it to be. My finances are just great. My money out there is just a great big cloud of atoms. And it's going to be, it's going to, my money is going to relate to me according to the shape it takes when I look at it. You know, we look at things without them being there with our thoughts, with our imaginations. With our imaginations, we look at things before they're created, don't we? So what do we see? What do you see about your finances? What do you see about this or that or something else? We're talking about healing for one thing, but you can think about finances, your material provision, your future, what your life's going to be like when you get old, you know, just, just whatever it may be. All those imaginations that you have 
are floating around out there in, in atoms, but don't do bad ones. Don't say bad things to your atom clouds. Say good things to them. That's what the father said to the Israelites. He said, I said before you this day, uh, life and blessing, right here, Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We make the choices. What you do and believe affects everyone and everything around you. You actually create your own reality. Your perception of life becomes your life. Now, this isn't, again, just talking about some uh, positive confession, mental exercise type of thing. This is the word of God. Years ago, these things that God is saying right here, choose blessing and not cursing. Choose life and not death, that both you and your seed may live. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That could not be scientifically proven. That was just taken as a, as a spiritual principle that God was giving his people. But it couldn't be proven physically, uh, scientifically, until just recently, in the last 30 years. But God said this millennium ago to his people in the wilderness, the children of Israel, when he brought them out of Egypt. He told them right then that you have the control over your life. So you choose life. You choose blessing. You choose blessing and not cursing. You choose life and not death. They weren't even born again yet. So this principle will work for even people that aren't born again. But now that we are born again, we have the mind of Christ on the inside of us. We can tie the, the faith realm, the spiritual realm, now to this physical realm and see how God has set up the matter of this world to work by responding to the spiritual world. Oh my. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, I want to go over now and just read from this book right here for you just a little bit. This is kind of technical today, I know. Page 109. This man is a uh, physicist, very famous physicist, Jim Al Khalili, uh, in Britain. He's not born again. He believes in evolution. And if there is a God, he doesn't know it. And I don't think that he wants to know right now. I've been kind of praying for him about all of that. I'm just going to read to you a little bit. Just just go along with me today because I want to plant some, plant some new thoughts and and uh, widen your brain a little bit, if you want to put it that way. Quantum mechanics or quantum physics is seen quite rightly as the most fascinating, yet at the same time most mind-boggling and frustrating scientific theory ever devised by humankind. Well, right there, he's kind of off. It wasn't devised by humankind. It was devised by God. <laughs> Hallelujah. In a particular segment of my lecture at the Royal Institute, I discussed the famous two-slit experiment. Now we're going to talk about quantum entanglement right here. The two-slit experiment which describes what the American physicist Richard Feynman called the central mystery of quantum mechanics. The central mystery of quantum mechanics. After outlining just how astonishing the results of the two-slit experiment are, subatomic particles, little teeny tiny atoms, are shot through two slits. One, one atom is shot, there's two slits in a piece of paper, that atom, that one atom, goes through both at once. What? What? See, right there, we're out, the mind is out of its league completely. 
After outlining just how astonishing the results of the two-slit experiment are, subatomic particles, what is the two-slit experiment he's going to tell us, subatomic particles fired one by one through a screen with two narrow slits in it, behaving as though they're traveling through both at once and giving rise to an interference pattern on a second screen. I issued a challenge to my audience. If anyone could come up with a common sense account of how this was happened, they could win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'll tell you how it happens. God. But he doesn't believe in God. <laughs> oh, they can't figure it out. They can't figure it out. See, this is why it's so exciting. We can, you can sit here and we can read this book by one of the most famous physicists in the world. Oh my goodness. I listen to his videos a lot on, on, on YouTube. Um, but he just comes to the end of himself because they won't acknowledge God. How in the world can one atom go through two slits at the same time? If you can figure that out, you can win the Nobel Prize. Well, we got it figured out. God set it up to work that way. It's, that's just it. Oh, I love it. Oh. I said this as a lighthearted joke, safe in the knowledge that no one has ever found a simple explanation to this. Despite decades of debate and hundreds of ingenious tests, leading physicists, to reluctantly conclude that whatever is going on really does not have a common sense explanation. Well, of course it doesn't. This really is the way that matter behaves in the quantum world, and we just have to accept it. Amen. But God made that little atom to go through those two slits at once. And that shows off and comes out of there and it hits a little paper in the back. And it's got a special thing it does too. And they can't figure that out either. Ha 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 ha. But we know the one that's done it all. See how powerful. He's giving us insight into his secrets. He's using quantum physics here to undergird our faith and show us why speaking the word works. How powerful of a being that we really are because he made us a speaking spirit in his image. And we can make things work and understand things where quantum physicists can't. Because we read the end of the book. We read the other half of the story. We read the first half of the story. They're just getting in on the last half. <laughs> oh, it gives me um, puppy belly laughs. That's like it says in Corinthians. That's just coming to me right now. Where the Lord said he'd take the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. The wise is though the Greeks wanted wisdom. Oh, hallelujah. And this and that and something else. But they couldn't find the cross. They couldn't find redemption. Hallelujah. The cross was foolishness to them. But we got the other side of the story. Oh, God's pulling the curtain back. He's tying heaven and earth together for us. Going on, Jim Al-Khalili speaking. I regard quantum mechanics or quantum physics as the most powerful and important theory in all of science. After all, it is the foundation on which much of physics and chemistry is built, and it has revolutionized our understanding of how the world is built from the tiniest building blocks. They have discovered that. <laughs> Woo! It has revolutionized our understanding of how the world is built. Period. Stop there. <laughs> God built the world, and he used all these little teeny tiny atoms to do it. Because he knew then that we could speak, and we could interact with these atoms. Oh, hallelujah. He just set it up. That's why he did it. He said, I want to interact with all these atoms. I want to make the atoms, and then I'm going to interact with them. Oh, and I think I'll make man in Miami so he can do that too. <laughs> Are we having fun yet? I am. Whew. 
The status of physics toward the end of the 19th century appeared to be complete. It had produced Newtonian mechanics, electromagnetism, and thermodynamics, and showed that together these three areas of physics successfully described the motion and behavior of everyday sized objects. That's your car, your body, your house, your dog, your cat, whatever. The motion and behavior of everyday sized objects and pretty much all phenomena we encounter around us from cannonballs to clocks, storms to steam trains, magnets to motors and pendulums to planets. Collectively, the study of all these things is referred to as classical physics. And it is still predominantly, in other words, classical physics, the things that are seen, the things of the seen world out here. And it is still predominantly what we are taught in school. However, classical physics, while still pretty good, is not the whole story. Hmm. So what we learn in the school, in our science classes, isn't the whole story. Because it's just about what we see out here with our five senses. When physicists turned their attention to the microscopic, in other words, what matter is made of, I think we'll start studying that. I think we'll go down deep. I think we'll get our microscopes out and start studying that world down there that we can't see with the eye. <laughs> when physicists turned their attention to the microscopic constituents of matter, atoms and molecules, oh, they discovered a new phenomena they couldn't explain with classical physics. Oh, oh, oh. that's not where I'm going. Oh, where am I going? And yet there was, and still is plenty. Oh, we're talking about light now. Let me, go, let me make sure I'm going over here. I just made notes here. 109, 111, 112, now I'm going to 114, okay. Talking about light. This is interesting over here, he's talking about light. And how they used to think that light was little, these little packets coming down, like the little protons, photos, photoelectric effect. The little packages of light coming down in photons. Photography. See, that's that same word, little photons. Now they're discovering that light is a cloud. It's more of a wave substance. <clears throat> there is still, and yet there was, and still is plenty of contrary evidence suggesting that light is made up of waves rather than a stream of particles. So which is it? Is light a wave or a particle? See, we're back to waves. The clouds that surround the atom, waves and things. The answer is, frustratingly, flying in the face of intuition and common sense because it can behave like either one. Depending, are you... It's right here. He's saying it. <laughs> are you ready for this? Oh, my, 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 my. Is light a wave or a particle? The answer, frustratingly, flying in the face of intuition and common sense is that it can behave like either, depending on how we look at it. And the sort of experiment we devise to probe it. Hmm. Seemed like that's what Annette Caps just said over here. I think I'll go back and read it to you right quick. Are we having fun yet? The interesting thing is that scientists have, page eight, have discovered that the electron that is shown orbiting the nucleus is not always there as a, in a particle form. That's what here just saying is light. Is it particle or is it a wave? It's not always there in particle form. It exists in a wave state, like a cloud everywhere at once until someone looks at it. When the scientist observes it, it suddenly appears as a dot or a particle. What we all want to know is, how does it know someone's looking at it? Mm. It obviously is responding to the observer's interaction with it. Mm. Now that's just what he said. 
It can behave like either a wave or a particle, depending upon how we look at it and the sort of experiment we devise to probe it. <laughs> so I, I wanted to get my little book out here today, The World According to Physics. I'm in chapter the chapter on the quantum world here. And I just wanted to get it out and read to you a little bit from it today to prove to you. Oh, my cover fell off. <laughs> <laughs> to prove to you what Annette is teaching in this little book. It's scientifically, scientific proof of it. <laughs> okay, what? Okay, here we go. It's just that we cannot carry out an experiment that would show both the wave and the particle of at the electron at the same time. They can't figure out how to do an experiment that will show it as a particle and a wave at the same time. It's either one or the other, and they have no control over that, which totally frustrates them. It is absolutely vital to stress here that while quantum physics correctly predicts the outcome of an experiment, what it does not tell us is what an electron is. Hmm. Only what we see when we carry out certain experiments to probe it. The only reason this no longer drives physicists crazy with exasperation is we've learned to live with it. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Particle, wave. Well, we just learn to live with it. We can't control it. We can't figure it out. We just learn to live with it. This balance between how much we can simultaneously know about an electron particle and its wave nature is governed by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yep. Which is regarded as one of the most important ideas in the whole of science and a foundation stone of quantum physics. Are you ready for this next part? I love it. I love God. Sounds like God to me. He, he's put limits. He's put limits on all of these things. Smart men. The uncertainty principle puts limits, puts a limit on what we can measure and observe. Werner Heisenberg is talking about. And he came up with this idea called the uncertainty principle that you can't always tell where the proton's going to be, where the electron's going to be, how they're, when they're communicating, how they're going to appear as a wave or a particle. It's just a bunch of jumble mumbo to them. They haven't got to the bottom of it yet. They just understood there, there's a certain amount of uncertainty involved in this whole thing that they can't get the answers to. And they just learn to live with it now. Keep from being frustrated. But see, I believe that's God. There, there, there are limits to what the human, the heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord. There are things still that are hidden. He has hidden from us that they still have not discovered. Maybe the time has not come. Maybe he never will choose to reveal certain things of how he created everything and how it all works to us. Till heaven gets here, or we get a heavenly body or something, <clears throat> escape the surly bonds of earth, as I call it. <clears throat> a related, okay, See, he doesn't believe that humans interact. Listen to this. A related common misunderstanding is that humans must play some kind of a crucial role in quantum physics, that our consciousness can influence the quantum world or even bring it into existence and measure it. This is nonsense. <laughs> our unit, just keep listening now. Remember, he believes in evolution. He's a Muslim for another thing, so that ought to tell you something. But he doesn't believe, anyway. So he doesn't believe that we as human beings affect the matter at all. This is nonsense. Our universe, all the way down to its elementary building blocks at the quantum scale, existed long before life began on Earth. It wasn't sitting in some fuzzy limbo state waiting for us to come along, measure it, and make it real. No, God did that. <laughs> But he doesn't acknowledge God as the creator. Huh. Yeah, it was a fuzzy limbo state. It was, it says, what does it say? Genesis. There was chaos. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. But till God said, well, yeah, it was a fuzzy limbo state. Waiting for God to come along, measure it, and make it real. 
But I, I'll forgive him for that. Bless his darling heart and stupid head, as Brother Hagen would say. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, if I loaded you down enough with all that, I think so today. I loaded you down enough with that. But I just wanted to read to you a little bit out of my book. I got another little book here I read from, Chuck Missler, Cosmic Codes. I've been over here in his chapter on... Um, The Code of Life. Oh, so I enjoy. I've been studying these things for a long time. Going back, however, now, these are just some scientific facts. I want to reinforce again what Annette has been talking about. What time is it? 2.16. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read from the beginning, if you don't mind. In 1972, I first heard the teaching on faith and confession. It took faith in God's word to believe that you can have what you say. I had never heard such a concept, and had it not been for the fact that the principle was plainly written in the Bible, I would have considered it to be crazy. However, there it was in red letters, spoken by Jesus, no less. Mark 11:23. If you say to the mountain, be, it, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart, but believe that those things which you say shall come to pass, you will have whatsoever you say. Looking at it from a surface level, it would seem a ridiculous surface level. Looking at it from a surface level, it would seem a ridiculous statement that Jesus made. How is it possible that spoken words can send a mountain into the sea? For the past 27 years, it has required faith on my part to believe that words are that powerful. Recent study in the area of quantum physics, however, has convinced me that what Jesus spoke is absolute scientific fact. As I studied the theories of quantum physics, I was reminded of a prophecy given by my father, author and teacher Charles Capps. He said, some things which have required faith to believe, in other words, the power of words that Jesus was referring to in Mark eleven twenty three. Some things which have required faith to believe will no longer necessarily require faith, for it will be proven to be scientific fact. What is he talking about? Your belief that words affect the matter of your life, that words affect matter, that your words affect the matter of your life. Words are energy, and energy affects matter. I'm going on. <clears throat> Scientists have performed experiments with atoms and their subatomic particles, such as electrons. The interesting thing is that scientists have discovered that the electron that is shown orbiting the nucleus is not there in a particle, always there in a particle form. It exists in a wave state, like a cloud everywhere at once until someone looks at it. When the scientist observes it with his microscope, then the cloud suddenly turns into a dot. You could say matter has come into existence. It's a cloud waiting to become matter. But when you interact with it, then what is in a cloud form right now turns into substance or matter. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith gives substance to things hoped for. When the scientist observes it, it suddenly appears as a dot, a particle. What we all want to know is, how does it know someone is looking at it? God created matter that way. He created it so it knows and reacts to us as human beings. Again, Psalm 115.16, The heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth has he created to respond to the children of men. One of the difficulties in quantum physics is that the particles behave somewhat differently for each observer. So each person is Lord and master over their own life. In other words, over the matter of their life, as control of it. 
behave such somewhat differently for each observer, which leads me to the question, does it behave according to what you believe? Does the matter of your life, is it behaving according to what you believe? See, that's quantum entanglement. Your beliefs, your words, your reactions, the, the, the attitudes coming off of you, everything is interacting with the matter that your body and the world is made of because God created it to do that. We don't make it do it. God made it do it. How, how does that a party, our, a wave again know someone's looking at it to turn into a particle? And does it become the particle that each scientist is believing at the time? His attitudes, his ideas, his thoughts. One of the difficulties in quantum physics is that the particles behave somewhat differently for each observer, which leads me to the question, does it behave according to what the scientist believes? In any, in any, any event, we can definitely conclude that Jesus was right when he taught that all matter responds to faith and words. Responds to fear, too. Anger, whatever it may be. The substance from which our world is made is influenced and manifested by words. The substance of which our world is made is influenced by words, and we can cause it to manifest by words. The things that you desire are made up of atoms. Oh my. They know what you believe, they hear what you say, and they behave accordingly. <sighs> Help us, Father, to get our feet out of the mud and our heads, Father, out of this five sense realm and live, Father, from that place where we're seated and hidden in Christ in heavenly places. Father, even just to be what you created us to be in the beginning, a speaking spirit having dominion. Oh, I want to go over here and in closing today, just read you a few of these versions of this psalm here. Psalm 115.16. <clears throat> The King James Version is basically the one that I've been telling you about. The heaven, even the heavens, belong are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. That's the King James Version, 21st century. Then we're going down here to the CSB, whatever that is. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the human race. Here's another one. The highest heaven belongs to the Lord, but he gave the earth to all people. The Lord has kept the heavens for himself, but he has given the earth to us humans. The heavens are heavens for the Lord, but the earth he gave to the children of Adam. Then down to the Message Bible. The heaven of heavens is for God, but he put us in charge of the earth. You know, we see wars, rumors of wars, all the things that are going on right now. Life-threatening things, things in the economy, just all kinds of things going on. And... We think, well, God's sovereign. He's orchestrating all of this. Is he? He has a plan. Yes, it's running in the background. And he is sovereign over that. The heaven of heavens, the eternal plan. Isaiah 46.10. I tell the end from the beginning. That's running in the background. And one day Jesus will come back and the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. He'll reign in Jerusalem on David's throne. And the plan of God will once again be the sovereign in the earth. But now during this time, since Adam being created, the earth and dominion and the sovereignty over it and what happens in the earth economically, 
medically, uh, in relationships, governments, all different things, come about by the decisions and the will of men. The heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Hallelujah. I heard that verse, oh, maybe 20 years ago. And I can say that for 20 years as a believer, I believed what it says, but I never heard a verse like that that actually said it. The heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. So what has been our title here today? Again, let me say it. Matter, matter, table, lamp, telephone, matter, atoms, 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 atoms. Tree outside, Adam. Squirrel one running in the yard, Adams. Cotton laying out by the road, Adams. <laughs> Matter is made up of atoms, and atoms are in the form of clouds. And they react, they take shape when you speak words. Matter, atoms, Clouds, you, words. What did the Lord say to me? September the 2nd. Words, words, words. The golden key. Mm, my. Your body is made of matter. It's made of atoms. Can you speak and cause those atoms that maybe have been shaped by death shaped by sickness, shaped by disease. Can you speak and cause those atoms to change into life and health? It's your body, isn't it? Aren't you the sovereign over this body? Isn't this body reacting to your words more than anybody else's? Oh, yes, it is. To your thoughts about it more than anybody else's? Your atoms are even aware of the thoughts you think because of that quantum entanglement thing, the way God has created us as a unit, spirit, soul, and body. What goes on in our inner man affects our outer man. It's uh, the atoms of our outer man. God just made it that way. Hallelujah. Well, I hope you've all found this interesting today. Oh, I just, some of you, this is just new information, but it's like we just have to dig for the gold sometimes. God wants us to understand, you know. He wants us to know him. He wants to, us to pal around with him. He wants us to act like him. Say, oh, look, they're getting it down there. They're figuring out that they are, I created them a speaking spirit. Now you watch how their language is going to change. When they come to that understanding more and more, they're going to speak like I do. They're going to call things and be not as though they are. They're going to speak to mountains and see them removed and cast into the sea. They're going to use, learn how to use words, the golden key. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you today. Oh, Lord. Equipping, 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 equipping your saints with knowledge, Father. You don't want us just to leave our heads at the door when we enter into your spiritual house, when we sing and praise and worship or read your word. Father, you want us to think your thoughts after you, to understand your ways. You said, Father, that you showed your acts to the children of Israel, but you made your ways known to Moses. And Lord, I thank you that even today, science is unveiling more and more your ways in our creation. Father, and that you are the creator of you, the spirit, the unseen one, are the creator of this world of matter in which we live. These bodies of matter in which we live. Father, even our souls, our mind, will, and emotions is composed of a spiritual matter that you created. 
and us, Father, the spirit made in your image. And it all can interact. You've made it to connect together and react and function together, Father. So help us to speak responsibly, to think responsibly, to think, Father, oh, before we speak, I am affecting the atoms of my body. And Father, I thank you for it this day. In Jesus' name. Oh, amen and amen and amen. God bless you all. I'd like to shout out to my Jenny today. Hi, Jenny. Love you, sweetie. Check in with you all later. And all of you on the YouTube channel. God bless you all today. Hallelujah. Give me a thumbs up. And a like and a good comment. I always respond to comments and even here on the Facebook page. If you make a comment, I always respond to the comments or questions. Hallelujah. Check in later. Aren't you loving this subject? I'm looking forward to next time already. Hmm?